whenever you are ready, John. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Thursday. Um, we're going to go over the artist um, Nicholas Lopez and his 10 colors. Um, about two weeks ago, you'd have seen uh, Nicholas Lopez and Angela um, and Michael um, in France where they were doing collaboration painting. So we'll go over um, his 10 colors and I picked out about um, seven uh, different colors as well um, that we'll all we'll play with today. So I'm going to just open up Facebook on the other side. Close that down. Okay. So if you have a question on Facebook, I'll be able to see that. And um, on Zoom, you can just ask me directly um, any questions. Hello, Mark. Hello, Lisa. Okay. Welcome, everybody. So our artist um, tomorrow is Nicolas Lopez. Nicolas comes from Peru and um, he has 10 colors of his set. Now he may or may not use these colors. He may use other colors. I think you asked him that when um, he was painting in France and he showed his palette. So he uses quite a few other colors as well. Uh, but this is gonna be in the set that we're gonna see today is Bloodstone Genuine, Piemontite, Lunar Black, Lunar Blue, Moon Glow, Cascade Green, Chinese White, Haynes Gray, Ultramarine Blue, and Lavender. So that's what we're going to see, and we're going to see some other colors too. So I'm going to put this down, turn it so it doesn't fall. Not turn. All the camera equipment for the new studio. I don't have all the expertise, however, to put it together. So that should be soon. Right. And then there was a question by Paul Wang, a very interesting question, and it was. How does water dry? And I don't know if any of you, I, I, I knew there was answers being given. So I'm going to ask you that one more time, and then we're going to go over how water dries. It's, um, it's actually extremely complex. I saw a few PhDs that were written on water. So um, super, super complex. <laughs> But I think it's like everything. We look up in the sky if it was, you know, 100 years ago and somebody saw a 747 or a 777 in the air, they'd be in extreme awe. Now, because I live right near the uh, SeaTac airport, I see jets go over probably every 20 minutes. I don't give them a second thought. Paul was uh, was the consummate teacher. It was really interesting that uh, he spent so much time trying to evoke thinking. That's that's a kind of a rare talent. So get those. Something you can see it as I'm, I'm squeezing out the tubes over here on the other side. So let me show you his colors, then we'll paint his colors out. So a few other ones as well. 
So one of the ones we're going to see is we're going to see Cascade Green. The Cascade Green, the neat thing about Cascade Green is that it's that co-precipitated pigment that when you add water, it kind of breaks out the two pigments that are joined, co-precipitated. So they're, they're joined together and the addition of water, they can break loose. And you kind of see that, kind of see the yellow tinge in here. And you can actually see kind of a, a bluish down here. So I had one artist, uh, Julie, um, say that she had left her painting with Cascade Green and came back and it was like gnomes had taken over her artwork because she knows she didn't use blues and yellows and then she saw that on her on her artwork and it was because the Cascade Green and how it comes apart. So a very, very interesting color. And Nicholas uses this one. The other one that we've talked about many times is the Lunar Black. And the neat thing about the Lunar Black is what makes it unique is that it's a synthetic pigment. It's Mars Black. Um, and the particles are so small that they move away from each other. You normally don't get that. You normally don't get granulation within a single pigment. You get that when there's a different weight, uh, a different shape, but these are all the same weight. They're all the same shape. It happens to be because they're so small and they move away from each other. So you get this really awesome granulation or reticulation. Really, really, really quite beautiful. And you saw Nicholas work with that um, if you watched him in, in France. Another one is the um, bloodstone. The bloodstone is a very, very beautiful mineral. Um, it has great granulation. It's an iron oxide. So your hematites, your hematite violet, um, hematite, those are all iron oxides, as is this. And they have that really, really fantastic granulation. So another genuine is the piemontite. And the piemontite, again, it has also very, very good granulation. Um, saw this used quite a bit when we were in Porto in, in Portugal. Um, it was one kind of the, one of the go-to colors. There's lavender. So uh, I'm gonna show you something special about lavender today. So this is lavender. He uses the ultramarine blue. So we know that the ultramarine, both the PB29 is in French ultramarine. It's also an ultramarine. The French ultramarine is slightly larger. So it moves toward the red or the warm. The ultramarine is slightly cooler. So it moves toward the cool or the green. It's a smaller particle versus the French, which is a larger particle. Absolutely the same pigment, just different size. Also in his set, he has Payne's Gray. He has Moon Glow. So Moon Glow, a little bit different than Shadow Violet. Moon Glow has the Athenacoid Red, the Verdian and the Ultramarine Blue. So you kind of see a, a, a kind of a, a red, red tinge to it. And then the Shadow Violet, the sister color, which is not in his set, is the pyro orange. So it has more of an orange to it, more of a red in the moon glow, more of an orange in the shadow violet. Another color that Nicholas uses is the Chinese white. So here, this is actually Chinese white right here, but to make sure it can easily be seen, this is it over black, so black. Um, ground, so you can kind of see it. And just to show you, I get asked this quite a bit. This is titanium white, so Chinese white, titanium white.
This is said to be warmer, the Chinese white is said to be warmer than the titanium white. Lunar blue is another color that Nicholas uses it, uses. Hello, Nona, hello, Marie. Hello, Annette, it's good to see everybody. So these are the other colors I picked out. I, I brought some of these out that we can play with, but just wanted to show you some other ones. This is a brown iron oxide. So you know, we have the we have the piemontites, etc. That granite. This is a an iron oxide. Again, iron oxide. Same thing that's in the um, the bloodstone. It's an iron oxide. So iron oxides have a real tendency to granulate, have that really rich granulation. We also have environmental friendly iron oxides. So not only do we have the titanium, but we have the gray titanium, and probably another one that many of you have used, it's, it's, it's quite popular, is the buff titanium. So there's the... Don, I thought yes. you should mention that Nicholas just entered our Zoom room. Nicholas, I'm sorry. N Nicholas is with us. He's joined. Oh, hello, us. Nicholas. We're going to be looking at your set today and then <laughs> watch you do master work with it tomorrow. So thank you for joining. Uh, he doesn't have to have his audio ready, but he just uh, just to let everybody know that he's in the room. I wanted to show you, this is the pearlescent shimmer. The reason I bought pearlescent shimmer out to show you today is I went to a laboratory and I took out one of the new sticks they're working on. And this is the pearlescent, this is the, the pearlescent um, stick. It's a weird shape because it hasn't gone through manufacturing. It's just out of the laboratory. And we'll play with that a little bit today. And I also took another one they were working on. They're working on lavender. So this is lavender. That's why it's so weirdly shaped. Of course, they're trying to find out who took our stuff. So um, I have to bring it back today. And then this one, the reason I brought out the iridescent uh, electric, iridescent electric blue is because this iridescent electric blue stick. So a couple of weeks ago, it was asked, well, are you working on new sticks? And the answer to that is yes, working on new sticks. Um, the iridescent blue, because it's such a very popular color, if there's one iridescent that's used, it's the iridescent electric blue. So we'll play with that today. Um, and then Claudia, who, I don't know if she's on the other side. Um, Claudia Diz Hernandez asked about lavender. So we, we did lavender. So we'll play with those. Um, so Nicholas and many other use Payne's Gray. We also have Payne's Blue Gray. So Payne's Gray, we also have Payne's Blue Gray. Hello, Nicholas. I'm waving to you upside down. <laughs> And I also brought out um, a sugilite, so you can kind of see the sugilite. Again, there's lots of granulation there. So this is the bloodstone that Nicholas uses. This is the hematite. Again, also a genuine, also an iron oxide. And then some other, you know, this is the lunar violet. This is the lunar red. So Payne's gray is used sometimes to bring down the um, vibrancy of a color. So is neutral tint. Um, 
and then another one is James Gray. Jane actually will be um, joining us at some point as well. So those are actually uh, 10 of Nicholas's colors and some other colors too, just to show you some, some, some others. So with that, let's look at some of these colors. May I ask a question? Yes. Earlier you mentioned brown iron oxide and it showed that it was a great granulator. And I'm looking on your resources and I'm not seeing brown iron oxide. I see one called transparent brown oxide. Is that the same thing? Let me see which one I showed you. The one I showed you was environmental friendly brown iron oxide. So the environmental friendly um, comes from a Superfund site in America. That is um, a site that in early history might have been um, polluted. And companies come in and they clean up the area, which is fantastic. That's why you have such nice streams anymore and they'll take out uh, the, different, uh, the different elements. And one of them is the iron oxide. They'll purify it. They'll make sure it's absolutely pure. And I buy it from them just to put money back into the system. It's actually more expensive, um, but part of that money goes back to now cleaning up the next stream and the next stream and the next stream. So it's kind of a, a, a way to keep on giving back. Okay, so this one right here is the Bloodstone Genuine. So this we add water to it. Is the cascade green? It's cascade green with some of the bloodstone. And I'll jump to it before Gabriel does. Can you spray it with water so that we can see it spread? I'm sorry. I'll jump to this before Gabriel does. Can you spray it with water so that we can see it spread and dilute? Sure Please, thing. thank you. Spray it already. That looks great. This one can be a little hard to see. This one's going to be Chinese white. Jane. 
Chinese white. How about Buenos Aires? That is certainly high on my list. Beautiful place. All right, this is going to be lavender. I'll put it over here so Cascade Green doesn't get into it. Ethel is yeah. Nicholas still there? Nick Nicholas, yes, he's there. Can you ask Nicholas? He has Chinese white. Um, is he going to be using Chinese white tomorrow? And and how does he use it since it's um, not everybody uses it? This is uh, lunar black. Nicholas, ¿cómo vas a usar tu Si tienes el blanco de China y cómo lo usas normalmente. Hola a todos. Soy Jason Rosa está para aquí. Bueno, eh, eh, el blanco de China. Para mí el blanco es una. Um, Nicholas, just I just have to stop you there. Can you up the volume a little, please? Thank you. Can you subir el volumen? Excel, we are so, so near that the sound um, goes on one on top of the other. Okay, now. A ver, a ver, para, para lo momento. Ven aquí, habla, a ver si te escuchan. No. Can you hear him? <laughs> try, uh, try speaking. A ver, habla. Hola, hola, hola. I think that's a little better. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Uh, uh, el blanco de China, uh, para mí es un pigmento muy interesante porque me permite generar perspectiva a todos los tonos y sobre todo a generar luz um, en los espacios um, oscuros, cubiertos. Es interesante agarrar altos contrastes con, con, el, con, el, con el blanco, ¿no? Eh, no tener tanto cuidado con el papel, sino dejar que el pigmento mismo me genere la luz. Nico, eh, sí, apaga tú. So, Angela, can you... Let me see if I remember. Can you hear me? Yes, hear can you all hear me? Hear you fine. Okay, uh, according to Nicolas, he uses his white to give some light. Para dar luz y para qué? To give perspective to the tones. And so he doesn't have to be so uh, concentrated on keeping the white of the paper. No? Para que no esté tan concentrado manteniendo blanco de papel, no? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Angela. Gracias. Gracias. So here we have lunar black. This is lunar blue. And this is moon glow. You can see that cascade green. You can really see that. It's, it really breaks out. You see that? Yeah, you can really kind of see it breaking out. Could you spray the spore as well, please? Of course. Or even splatter some water. That too. On which one? All of them? All of them, please.
this paper really, there we go, this one's still kind of, kind of wet. It's a thirsty paper. And John, if you could tilt it. Let me, let me, let me, let me just do this. Sometimes too, you can even tap the back of the paper to get some of that granulation going. So here I see it grounding really, really quite heavily. I've seen Nicholas do some uh, paintings and he'll, he'll, he'll take it and he'll just hold it up or even let it set and let everything move and then he'll flip it around and let it move some more to really just uh, activate that paint. Pour some more out. Pigmento. Really what it, you know. Hi, uh, Gabriel. That is totally exact. I don't know if everybody can hear me. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, it's very important. Also, one very important uh, detail is that you should use a lot of pigment, more than you have there, much more. Yeah. To generate granulation. So this is the Payne's gray. So when Paul asked about the water, did any of you, what do you think the answer was? What was your answer? Oh man, are we back to the blow dryer and water question? Uh, I think the question was, how, how does water dry? So I, I did two little samples, or actually a couple of samples here. Uh, awesome. I have uh, some lunar black. And then um, this one here was done with a blow dryer. And then this one was not done with a blow dryer. And I used a very rough, rough paper. But yeah. this paper also absorbs quite a bit. Now here's the same uh, with a stick. Uh, just dipped in water. So these two dried on their own. And this one was uh, dried with the blow dryer. There just seems like so much more life uh, in allowing these two to dry on their own. And this one uh, definitely went for a color that's supposed to be so granulated. It really just kind of flattened out. And that was the one that was blow dryer? That is correct. There's a really good reason for that. That was a great exercise for you. So we'll go over it. That's exactly, all that stuff you said was exactly right on the money. And there's reasons for it. So we'll do that, we'll go over it. It's, it's actually kind of fun. For those of you that have fun doing that kind of thing, it's, it's actually kind of fun. Good job, Gabriel. I have a lot to learn.
you know, the world's not a good place if you don't have a lot to learn. And that's kind of one of the reasons to, to live is to learn. And then tomorrow you'll see the master paint with these colors or paint with other colors. Because I know he paints with other colors as well. He being Nicholas. So I'm going to show you the last two colors of Nicholas. I'm going to show you some other colors that he may use, but they're not in his um, set. So I just want to make sure this is probably, this is probably one of my favorite colors. I know it's a very, it's a very plain color. When I put another color down, it'll focus. So I'll leave another one. This one's really pretty too. So ultramarine blue and Piemontite. Ultramarine blue is probably, it's for me, it's, it's, such, a, it's such a pretty color. And it's such a vibrant. I think most artists have it on their, oh, Claudia. Claudia, I don't know if you saw, but look. Lavender and a stick. This is the drives from outside to inside, from top to bottom. Okay. We're going to see that and then we're going to tie Gabriel's work into it. So this is going to be ultimate. So John, how long would I have to let this tube of lavender sit out in the sun to make that uh, stick? Uh, so you can make you can make it get hard. I don't want that to take. Um, it, it would. So that would be the drying process, but kind of we're going to go over in a minute. But it still wouldn't be the same as the stick, right? It's it's the amount of water would be unbelievable that you have to get out of it. And the thing about you know drying versus evaporation. So the thing that we're going to go over is evaporation. That's how things water, how water dries is through evaporation. And you get the top surface but you wouldn't get the inside surface because once the outside gets hard in the tube, um, it takes a longer time for the middle to dry out. So that's why we have to use machines to make sure we're getting at all the surface areas of it. Okay, this one. This one is the... So a lot of people use the neutral tin. We try it here ourselves. Take some of the ultramarine. Ultramarine's not that bright of a color. Neutral tint. So on um, Nicholas's, Nicholas uses Payne's gray. This is going to be Payne's, Payne's blue gray. Payne's 
Give me gray. This one I like. This is this is the hematite. This is hematite genuine. This is the uh, here's our, our first set of colors that we looked at. And these are the last two of Nicholas's right here, the ultramarine and the Piemontite. And Cindy, I could see you raised your hand. Do you have some questions for John? If you have, you can go ahead. Well, Cindy. I can't hear you. So when you take your speaker off, I'll take your speaker off. Can you take the speaker off, Ethel? There we go. Oh, yeah. Cindy. Hi. You had said something earlier about the lavender that you were going to show us. Yes. Did you do it and I missed it? Nope. No, I'm going to show okay. you as, as, as the stick. And we'll, we'll right. go ahead and look at that right now. All right. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Gabriel Giovanni, do you wet your paper first or do you just do dry stick? Do you spray first? Uh, it just depends. Uh, like uh, I recently uh, tried it just uh, with this one here with just on dry paper. Oh, very and cool. And then this one over here towards the bottom, uh, that was the paper was wet. So this okay. paper over here was a 300 pound. And then this one is a 140. So I was really, uh, I also dipped the stick in the water first as well. Yeah, I, I I use a little spray, you know, on my paper um, because I, I I prefer the um, use the, the the stick in the directly on the water. Uh, let me do. I'm going to put. Uh, Put some of the panes gray just to give the camera something to focus on because otherwise it won't focus. There we go. It's too much white for it otherwise. So this right here is the lavender. It really looks like lavender in front of me. It's it's the my camera skews it more toward um, the blue, and it's definitely not blue. I'm looking forward to this stick because I buy uh, two tubes at, at once of this color. So there's the lavender.
So we did the lavender for Alvaro Casane, the tube. And then it's a stick that Claudia had asked about. I'm curious how Nicholas uses the lavender. Yeah. Well, he can either, he, Nicholas can tell us now or he can tell us tomorrow. Mañana. Hola, hola. Nicholas, how do you use the lavender in your, in your artwork? Because we know that your, the darks you use are just gorgeous. Mm. Uh, el lavanda para mí es un es un azul bastante templado templado quiero entender que es un, un color es como un blanco pero con un color suave sutil que va a, a darle un, un acabado terciopelo suave a, a los tonos intermedios eh, me sirve también para generar eh, una luz media no intensa Eh, y es un tono que se adecua muy fácil a mis colores fríos que tengo de los 10. ¿no? Cierras el micrófono. Eh, Nicolás uses lavender as a, like a, to make a soft white with a little tint of a color, little hue. And it gives uh, his colors like a velvety um, feel, like very soft light. It's another way to use the light. Thank you, Nicholas. Let's see if I can show you that. Thank you, Nicholas. So there it is on black, drawn from the brush, then directly from the stick itself. And there it is on white. Um, can you repeat the color, please, uh, John? This is iridescent electric blue. Iridescent ah. electric blue. And this is going to be pearlescent. This one's going to be pearlescent. We're not going to see much over the white. Is that pearlescent or pearlescent white? So pearlescent white, it's 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 pearlescent white. There's pearlescent white and pearlescent shimmer, and the shimmer just is the same pigment, just larger particles. Thank you. How is that different than the iridescent moon shade? Or moonstone, sorry. Moonstone is more gray than, than, than shimmer. So it's like um, it's turning on uh, silver. Thank you. So it's loaded with If you want to see those, uh, Gabriel, I can find them in my drawdowns and send them to you. Gabriel, so Moon Glow goes, goes closer to purple and black here, and the shimmer is more of a white. Very nice. There we go. All right. So with that,
So that is my, that's my water droplet. And see a droplet and the same droplet on a different substrate, which is more absorbent. It takes it, it just goes into the paper, it absorbs, but it's still, it's still wet. So how does a water droplet dry? It dries by evaporation. And what that means is, so H2O water, Over the entire surface of that water, over the entire surface, water molecules are leaving in the process of evaporation. And so water molecules have to leave. Simultaneously, there's also water molecules in the air. And that's going to play a part as well. So if we want it to dry, evaporate, we want these water molecules to leave and to not come back. So the main difference in, is evaporation. There has to be a change from the liquid state to the gas state. Water in a liquid state will stay in a liquid state if the humidity is too high. So for it to dry, it dries across the entire water droplet, okay? So there's some things that make it very difficult to dry. There's three main things. You have these, these water molecules have to break free and get loose for something to dry. If the air is too humid, if there's too much water already in the air, then one of these water molecules could come off, but one of these free ones that's already in the atmosphere can come down and go on top of the drop. So it doesn't go away. That's what, you know, high humidity makes things and stay moist because you can't get evaporation. The other thing that can speed evaporation, and you do this, Daniel, this guy, or, Gabriel, a couple of these were in your test. If you put a blow dryer, you can blow the water molecules away, which doesn't give them the chance to go back and join the droplet, and therefore you're going to speed evaporation. Okay. So airflow can matter a lot. Temperature can matter a lot. If you have high temperature, you can have these water molecules move more rapidly. And as they move more rapidly, they can leave. That's why you have more evaporation in the heat than you do in the cold. You'll have more evaporation with a slight, and that's why you blow on your cup of coffee to cool it down. You're trying to blow away the hot water molecules to cool, that's evap evap evapotranspiration. You're making it cooler. So if we look at what you did, Gabriel, which was really fantastic, if you take a blow dryer, you're speeding this process up, right? You're speeding it up, therefore you're having it dry faster. What that can cause, however, especially within paints, say we had a cascade green or a granulating color, we're not allowing it to follow that paper and get that beautiful granulation. We're actually causing it and forcing it to evaporate faster and push down so we don't get that beauty, right? Because we're speeding up the process of the evaporation. So sometimes you really want to have that beauty of taking a while for things, for the water molecules to go away 
because then you're getting more of the granulation. As an artist, you can do whatever you want. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about being an artist. Um, but that's kind of what your, your, your process was showing, Gabriel, which was quite beautiful. Okay. Did Thank you all you get so that much. right? Oh, yeah. It's actually kind of fun. So it's, it's evaporation and it's across, it's across the whole, it's across the whole drop. Yeah, it's quite interesting. You have surface tension, you have cohesion, you have adhesion. I can see some of your faces drop as we go over it, but it's, it's actually kind of fun. Any questions you have on it? You said that there were two things keeping it from uh, drying, and um, and one of those wasn't oil. You know how like oil and water does mix. Well, if we're talking just about water, right? Just water thing, in general. The thing that slows it, because it will dry. The thing that slows it is having, if you have too much humidity in the air which exceeds the amount of water molecules coming off the, your, uh, whatever you happen to be, this, this is a uh, water droplet, could be that you put a bunch of water on your paper, for example. If there's so much humidity in the air, you can't, as one water molecule goes away, another one comes from the air and attaches. So essentially it's almost like a, a, it's a steel mate, right? For every two you're losing off of your, of your wet paper, two more from the atmosphere coming down to touch it and join, right? So one of the things that was talked about last time from Paul was he was saying on the stick, for example, he doesn't use it in his environment because they they he can have them stay wet. Well, if there's if you're in a if you're in a tropical environment like Singapore or Philippines, um, and the amount of moisture on your stick is less than the amount of moisture on the air, it's not gonna dry. You can overcome that by kind of doing what you did, which is you can, you can take off the excess water and then you can put them into a plastic and then shut it so you don't have that. But you're gonna have that with anything when there's excess humidity in the air. Um, we're dealing with watercolors, so, and I think artists in those environments have learned to overcome it. Yeah, uh, for sure. And the the temperature thing totally makes sense because I could tell the difference if I'm painting in the shade or if I'm standing out in the sun uh, with sunscreen on. Absolutely. You're having those particles move faster. If they, as they move faster, they can break away. And as they break away, the faster they can break away, the faster you have evaporation and you have drying. So it's uh, same principle that we put wet clothes in our, in our dryers and we tumble them, right? By tumbling them and having that airflow and that heat, it just speeds up the evaporation process. So it's very when cool. I paint, when I paint my largest paintings, I very strategically plan to do that on weeks that it's raining on and off through the whole week. Awesome. You guys are clever. It's, it's, that's really awesome. Okay, that's all I had to go over today. I thought, I thought the, uh, I did think that, uh, and I was kind of marveled about Paul um, in a very super pleasant way, like a fantastic teacher, um, having us think. It's such, it's such a neat thing. It's one of the, I think it's one of the beautiful things is um, trying not to give the answer but having people investigate, because there's a beauty in that investigation. I think we all learn by that. Um, if we just have the answer all the time. It's much, anyways, for me, it's much more difficult just to have the answer and not anywhere as fun as being able to try. It's like this, I'm trying to learn with this tripod that's beating me up. Um, the learning process is an awesome process. If there's something that I can answer, please let me know. Um, yeah, so Claudia says also non granulated pigments also differ with hair dryer. Yeah, the faster they go down, it, it changes. And, and, and actually, there's part of that you may really like. You say, I, I know that it doesn't. I really like that it does that. 
or like Anne Marie says is, you know, I like to paint when it's rainy. So she's using that humidity. So I think that's the beautiful. We all come from different places and we learn different things and it's great what we learn from each other. Thank you all very much. Nicholas, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Loved watching you in Paris. I love watching the duet between you and Michael. It was, it was absolutely fabulous. Um, look forward to the, the time with you tomorrow. It's great. Thank you all. Thank you for joining. See you all tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.